Hello, hello. Hi guys, welcome. I'll just wait just a minute here and see who all pops in. If somebody is able to uh, go in the Facebook group and remind people that we're on, that'd be great. I'm good. No, I'm not talking to you. Hold on one second. I'm periscoping, so no, I'm not talking to you. Do you want to be on periscope? Every time a periscope, guess who turns up? <laughs> Never fails. <laughs> he's normally not here tonight, but he's home with me tonight. So, um, tonight's chat will be food related. That was a suggestion. Oh, thanks. The one of the viola from earlier. I sat down there a long time waiting for him to come out, trying to get a picture or a little video. So, yeah, tonight's topic was uh, about food. So I posted the nutrition table over on the Facebook group. I think I'm going to turn this sideways. Food, food, food. So the nutrition table is a good place to start because Lisa went through and basically um, divided everything up into um, the needed nutrient and where to find it. So this makes it really easy to find foods that meet all of the needs. So that's kind of helpful to have. So if you guys uh, print that out, you'll have it to refer back to. The general rule of thumb with foods is going to be, it's already on Crab Street Journal. If you go to the website, I'm trying to get my fingers in the way here, and if you click over on the left right here on food and nutrition, that'll take you to all the articles we have on food and nutrition and I have all of them up so that we can kind of tile through them and one of them is the nutritional table and you can download it I think I also put it over on Google Plus today but if I didn't I'll get it over there so you want to remember with the f first rule of hermit crab food is it needs to be free of chemicals, table salt, preservatives, additives um, no pesticides, stay away from plants that are known to be toxic to other animals. Um, so no matter what we're talking about, that rule hold, holds true. All of those things have to apply to anything. Oh, that sucks, Angela. Well, I'm glad you're trying. Maybe you can catch the replay if it won't let you stay on. So one of the questions um, was, is there a signs of deficiency that you would notice in your hermit crab, whether it's behavioral or physical, um, to know that they're, they're um, missing out on certain nutrients and stuff? Uh, you would really probably only see this when you first get your crabs. Because once you have them in your tank and you've been feeding them a balanced diet, most of this stuff would go away. Um, typically, cannibalism is one of the signs of a deficiency. Um, like the, when they attack molters. And um, I don't consider, if they have a shell fight and one of them gets killed, I don't consider that cannibalism because it's usually related to the shell fight to begin with. And then... Hermit crabs are going to do what they're instinctively meant to do with any dead body, and then that's eat it. But if they're digging down to find a molter to eat, um, that's probably a sign of a poor diet, probably a lack of protein in their diet, um, maybe also um, lack of calcium. She asked about um, nipping of antenna. It was Stacy that suggested this. And I haven't ever seen that, but she mentioned that when she first got her crabs many years ago, she um, noticed that they were like pinching at each other's antenna. 
and she tried capturing it on um, camera because she thought maybe it was an indication of the uh, diet being lacking. And I've never seen that, so I don't know what would cause that. A lot of times the a lack of color or just being sort of a washed out color can be a lack of proper diet. Um, you can feed tannin as a color booster, which you would get from dried oak or sycamore leaves or raisins. And um, with the leaves, you can gather them in the fall, put them in the freezer for a little bit to kill off any bugs, and then add them to your tank in dense layers. They really like leaves. Um, you can also put safe woods in the tank because they will eat wood. You can put safe moss in the tank. Not only do they like to eat the moss, but it gives extra humidity in the tank. But again, make sure um, it's not been treated with pesticides. I mean, obviously it's not going to have salt and, and chemicals on it, but um, you need to check the list of safe woods. Yeah, just in a bag or whatever. Just uh, like I had to do, I had so many of mine, I have to do a little at a time. But um, yeah, like however many will fit in the freezer at a time just to get it cold enough to kill any bugs that are on there is all you're trying to do. Um, so for wood, you want to check the, the safe wood list, basically stay away from evergreen trees uh, and it's because of the aroma from the wood and stuff that's dangerous, not specifically the, the wood itself. So if you found like old driftwood that maybe came from a deciduous tree, um, or a fir tree, is it deciduous? Are the fir trees deciduous or do I have it backwards? Anyway, um, if there's no smell to it, it's not. it shouldn't bother them, but better safe than sorry if you're not sure. And she also asked about food specific to molting and like what you should feed pre-molt and post-molt. But in most circumstances, you know, we don't really know that, oh, they, they're probably going to molt next month, so I should start loading them up on all these good foods now. And the same as when they come up from a molt, um, there isn't anything specific that you should be feeding. You should just focus on always feeding a well-balanced diet. So if they're getting fish, fruit, calcium, um, greens, their fats, every week. Like it should be, even if you don't feel, feed it every single day and you rotate among the different days, like you have your protein one day with fish, maybe you have fruits the next day, um, veggies and stuff like that, nuts. Uh, just keep a balanced diet in there all the time so that they can have the best possible chance with molting. And new arrivals. I saw that you posted on CSJ that one of them came up, headed right for the food dish, huh? <laughs> Um, for new arrivals, new crabs, probably the same approach, just a balanced diet, offer them lots of different stuff. It's really important that they eat when you bring new crabs home because they need fuel to regulate their system and adapt to their surroundings. That's part of the basis of that um, PPS reduction uh, the PPS reduction procedure that we have. I thought I was going to sneeze. My allergies are really bothering me. Hi, Marnell. Um, the basis of that is new crabs need to be kept above ground so that they can eat and adapt to their better environment. So you don't put a ton of substrate in your isolation tank if you have brand new crabs. That keeps them above ground. You offer them lots of different stuff. Watching your e-shell shopping. <laughs> you need to start periscoping your hermit crabs. Foods that play a role in molting include amino acids, cholesterol, and calcium. So you'll want to make sure that you include the amino acids group. Hi, Anne. So the amino acids group is here on the chart. It tells you what foods that covers, so it gives you an idea of stuff that you can feed. Um, calcium can be um, 
in exoskeletons of cicadas, shrimp, crab, lobster, crawfish, krill. That helps. Um, also, you can just do calcium supplements. You can do cuddle bone. You can do eggshells. Yeah, it's on CSJ. If you go to the left over here and click on food and nutrition. Yeah, I also posted on the Facebook group so that you could just download it. I posted it as a PDF so that you guys could all have a copy of that to refer to. So it gives you, you know, you could pretty well feed off of this list and hit all the the food groups that you would need, I would think, pretty safely. You're welcome. You also want to make sure that they're getting um <laughs> they're getting uh a Daxithin, I'm not sure how you pronounce that. Zeaxithin and carotenoids um, found the astaxithin. Let's see here if I have that on here. Mm -mm -mm. I don't think this one is listed on here. This is on one of the other web pages. Um, but it's found in shrimp and krill and red seaweed. Um, I would think. Hmm. I'm sure they could eat the dried, uncooked rice, but cooking it kind of releases the starches, doesn't it? The last time I fed it, I cooked it, but then I just let it sit on the counter and let it dry out again so that I wasn't putting it in the tank wet and mushy, and they ate on that for days. Like, I just took it out a couple days ago, and that viola was still in there picking at it. So they really liked it like that. I don't know that it matters. I don't seem to have good luck with carrots. But again, I seem to have finicky crabs sometimes. But the um, the astaxithin, I think that's how you pronounce it, is the carotenoid found in shrimp, krill, red seaweeds, and um, crabs also... It gives crabs their reddish or orange color... So those are good to have in the diet. Um, I was reading one of our articles talks a little bit about how um, the lack of the astaxithin and zeaxithin and carotenoids, the lack of that could cause the bluish color that we see like in compressus. They call it blue ca crab syndrome. And you do notice that as the E's get older, they turn reddish orange and brown. So I don't know if there's like a lack of... Um, a lack of the, those three, I don't know, are they chemicals? In their food early on. Um, so the exaxithin is an important precursor to the astaxithin. They need that to regulate their body systems. So it's important that they have that all the time. They're minerals, thank you. <laughs> so it's important that they have that um, astaxithin or zeaxithin available all the time because it helps them regulate their body. Um, beta carotene is not as used as effectively by crabs and not as good as the, the zeaxithin if you can found, find it. And it's found in plants. It also gives the color to um, paprika, corn, saffron, wolfberries, and other stuff. So that's another one that's big for keeping their color rich and vibrant. Spirulina is a superfood. It's 60% protein. So even if you're not feeding meat, if you're feeding spirulina um, and like nuts and stuff like that, you may be meeting enough of the protein needs. Um, it's also a source of thiamine, riboflavin, iron, manganese, and of course the axithin that I just mentioned. You should always have some of this in your tank. The powder is really messy though and I find that sometimes it stains, so if I put it in a little bitty dish, the crabs end up wading in it and it gets a little bit sticky and it gets stuck to them. It's a better option to just lightly sprinkle it throughout your tank um, on the substrate, even on your decorations and stuff. So when they are climbing around, they can just sort of pick it up from the substrate. On popcorn, that's a good idea. Do you like toss it in a bag so it like coats the popcorn? That'd be a good way to do it too, Anne. Yep. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> the stuff that we do for our crabs. 
Yeah, it's a really good idea. Uh, sea vegetables like kelp or dulse um, contain iodine, vitamin C, manganese, vitamin B, vitamin A, copper, protein, phosphorus, iron, potassium, zinc, vitamin B, vitamin B6, and more. So having some kind of sea vegetables in there. Yeah, the popcorn is so, so loved by hermit crabs. Um, so kelp and dulse is another good option. I have kelp powder that I sprinkle in the tank also. It's dry, so it's easy just to, to sprinkle through the substrate. I like sprinkling as much as I can throughout the substrate so that they have the ability or the the opportunity to forage for food, which is their normal behavior. If the food's just like always in the dish, always in the same place every single day, it's not very stimulating where um, climbing around and finding food in all different places at least gives them... Um, that some semblance of foraging in the wild. Calcium carbonate can be added to the diet for their calcium needs. Um, I talked about some of the other ways um, just a few minutes ago that you could feed it, but you also can get crushed oyster shells and mix them into your substrate. That makes the uh, calcium available all the time. And then it also helps with aeration of your substrate. But you can also put a dish of calcium supplements in there. A leave an eggshell in there all the time. Um, but the stuff like the spirulina powder doesn't need to be cleaned up. It's it's just a natural ground powder. It, like it doesn't. It's not going to mold or hurt anything. The same with the kelp powder. It's not going to hurt anything. I've been doing this for a long time, and I only have isopods in my tank um, whenever I can find them outside. Yeah, wet food and stuff like that, I don't sprinkle. But, like, if I... You're scared of the isopods. If I even, like... I used to grind up my eggshells. I would just scatter that throughout the tank. It's not going to mold or rot or anything. Um, if you are if you have a tank, um, an isolation tank... Um, Things that you can offer in the isolation tank are honey, peanut butter, uh, egg yolks, and you can mix spirulina powder in that. That would be really good if you have a crab that's isolated because it's um, not doing very well. Maybe it had a bad molt. If they've lost their small pincher, those foods are all foods they can eat directly with their mandibles. Do you have a health food store near you, Beth? Because... Um, the health food store I have and one of the grocery stores has popcorn kernels in bulk. And I just go in and buy a little bitty bag of them. I buy like a quarter cup and then I pop mine in the microwave in a paper bag. And when you only have a couple crabs, like you could get, you know, 20 kernels probably for like a nickel and it would last you a long time. spirulina disc um are those the ones like you buy for placostomus and stuff uh, i believe those are safe i think they're 100 percent spirulina when i used to buy those um they were 100 percent spirulina that's all that matters just turn over and make sure there's no um like sometimes they'll put um preservatives or additives in there but they shouldn't in the spirulina because the most common is like the anti-caking and they obviously want those caked because they're in um, a disc form. So, yeah, if you have a crab that's missing, um, it's small pincher, giving them soft, goopy kind of foods that they can scoop up with their mouth is a good idea. That way you know that they're still eating and um, while they're waiting for that limb to grow back. Yeah, if you have, one of our regular grocery stores has an aisle that's all just bulk foods, and they just have rows of those bins, like they put the coffee beans in, and they have all kinds of stuff in there, so your grocery, if you have a grocery store big enough that has bulk stuff, you might find it there. Shop, oh, here it's a, it's a Deerberg's. Something that you might want to think about getting is the, um, that green sand I've been posting about over and over again. I haven't been able to narrow down today precisely um, 
the the direct benefit of it, but it's basically uh, like a mineral salt lick. So it's a marine sediment. that's rich in organic deatrice in low sed sedimentary input. So um, it's found basically in the deep ocean beds and it's all just minerals and organic material. And it's green because of, um, let's see. There's, I think it's the, this here, this glock, glauconite glauconitic sediment that makes it green. Anyway, if you guys have been following the pictures of my crabs, since I put this back in my tank, there's a crab in that dish every single day. And, hi, welcome, thanks for joining. The dish is up in the turtle dock, elevated, so they have to climb up there to get it. So they're seeking it out, and um, I know they're in there eating it because they keep pooping in there. So, here's my well, here, I have a nice big bag of it. Well, you can order it online, and I put our Amazon affiliate link up, but what I'm going to do is, this is way more, this is going to last me a long, long time. So I'm going to take this, and I'll divide it up into those little Ziploc bags, and um, put it in the prize bin, so that people can win little bags of it. So that'll be a little extra motivation to... Enter the contest. Yep, <laughs> prize contest. It's green sand from the bottom of the ocean. It's like a mineral lick kind of thing. The crabs really like it. Um, yeah, I'm, I am definitely not above bribing people to enter the contest. If you didn't want to wait, um, I could probably um, just sell you like a little bag for a dollar or something if you pay the postage also, and I could just mail you some. That way you don't have to... If you only have a couple crabs and you got to buy like... She said like a giant seven pound bag, that's going to last you like 10 lifetimes. So um, I have this bag that I'm willing to divide up because I'm not going to be able to use all of it either. So yeah, yeah, like they, they really, there's got to be minerals and stuff in it um, that they are craving because they're seeking it out. How much is the bag? Um... I, I feel like maybe it was around $20 or so. I put our link on the Facebook page. And then this is like the chemical breakdown of it. It has potassium, sodium, magnesium, aluminum, iron, silicon, hydrogen, oxygen in it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, if you go to, if we jump over to Amazon and look for, oops. I really can type. This is just harder than you might think. Green sand. And it's all one word. Um, so there's a five pound bag for eight dollars. Uh, that's that's fertilizer. You want this premium green sand. Eight dollars plus five shipping. 22 trace minerals. So my girlfriend uh, bought this for me at a, a dash button. Yeah. She bought this at a uh, nursery or something because they use it in, as fertilizer. So yeah, this is green sand is a mineral called glauconite, which is found on the ocean floor and mined for use as an organic fertilizer and soil conditioner. So this would probably be good just mixed into your, your substrate anyway, but they're eating it like mad. 22 trace minerals. Hmm. Okay. So, you can also look it up on Wikipedia. So let's jump over to some of the pages on Crab Street Journal that I want you to be aware of. The first one is... Oh, definitely. Yeah, and it it's fine and powdery. It would cake and stick to them. You could mix it into the substrate, yeah, and then it would just be there all the time. But you wouldn't want it as your exclusive substrate. 
Okay, I'm going to turn my phone back around this way. Doo -doo. So the first page is adulterants and additives in hermit crab food, and this is typically um, commercial food and processed foods and that can be harmful. Um, so Carrie wrote this and said, while there's no actual scientific proof, um, she just believes these substances are unnecessary in crab food. Oh, crabs, yeah. So um, you may want to look at that list to make sure stuff you're buying doesn't contain any of these items. All of these articles can be found by going to Crab Street Journal and clicking on the food and nutrition category. And you don't have room in your house for a bunch of huge crabs. Uh, the next article is the going natural beginners list so if you are limited to what kind of organics you can find or afford you can search out this list that are safe to buy um, as non-organic and stuff you should always buy as organic and that includes the um, the dirty dozen food list and then this is Carrie's article on getting rid of a commercial diet completely and um, these are like recommended human grade beginners food Highest in nutrition will make a good base for adding fresh fruit, vegetables, and meat, too. So this is a good, like, staples list. So she's got um, the first section here and then throw in some of these dried flowers, dried fruits. And then if you still have some money left over to shop, she recommends these items down here. So this would build you a nice beginner's organic hermit crab pantry basically and there's a reminder about the contest make sure you get your pictures in by tomorrow and then we've got edible flowers so that's the safe flowers list which tells you all the different flowers that your hermit crab can eat where to find them so they're not treated with pesticides or if you want to grow your own I do that with a few of them um, I could just grow them out on the back deck or out front. And most popular edible flowers. I do like her site. She's got lots of cool stuff on there. These are remedies for healing. Partial list of edible flowers used in remedies. And then poisonous posies. So this is uh, plants you want to avoid. And then this was based on um, some different books. And here's a couple books that you can purchase that are all about edible flowers. In most cases, if um, they're safe for us to eat and other animals to eat, it should be safe for your crabs to eat. But there's so many other known safe things out there. There's no reason to feed them questionable foods just to see what happens, you know. Um, what kind of foods are good and bad for hermit crabs? So this just talks about avoiding the chemicals and pesticides. This says moldy foods, but really I think moldy foods we've decided are kind of okay. It's just more gross to us. And then the uh, chart is also attached to this. And then Carrie talks again about foods that are actually beneficial for your crab to eat. This is a nice big list. So there's lots of stuff you can find on there, and this includes, like, there's oysters and fruit, um, peanut butter, pecans, the plain calcium carbonate. So this is not categorized by meat or anything like that. This is, like, everything. Um, if you can't find stuff on this list that's easily accessible to you in organic or natural form, you must, you would have to be, like, living on an iceberg, I think. <laughs> Oh, not me. I don't like oysters. Not at all. Okay, then foods that are bad for hermit crabs. Some are toxic. Some are used as insect repellents and insecticides. And some of them crabs just won't eat. Um, she says, like, lemons. The lemon won't hurt them, but they don't seem to have any interest in eating it at all. So there's a nice big long list there. Um, this is a really cool video on there of... A whole big swarm of strawberry hermit crabs eating from the garbage. 
Should I feed my hermit crabs meat? Um, they need protein, so if you choose to feed that to them in the form of meat, then by all means that's fine. Otherwise, look at some of the other options that are like vegetarian options for getting protein in their diet. But meat is definitely safe as long as it follows our golden rules of being free of chemicals, table salt, preservatives, additives. So you don't want to put seasoning and stuff like that on it. You don't want to put salt on it. It has to just be plain Jane meat. They can eat raw meat. Uh, if you want to put raw meat in your tank, just be really careful about getting bugs and flies and things like that. I prefer to do like a chicken leg and um, my dogs get most of the meat and then I leave just, you know, little bits of the actual meat on the bone and then I put it in like a Ziploc bag and I take it out on the garage floor and I bash it with a hammer so it's busted open so they can get to the marrow and then um, put that in the <laughs> tank and what little bit of meat is on there they'll pick off and then they'll pick at that bone marrow until um, they completely pick it clean. I've done that with rib bones too. And like later, you know, months later, um, a rib bone will surface randomly in part of the tank that somebody dug up, but it's like picks completely clean. It looks like it's been laying out in the sun and it's like bleached dry. So it's okay to give them bones too. Um, the power of protein. So this talks some more about protein and why they need it in their diet. Again, there's a link to the nutrition table on here. And then if you're not comfortable feeding meat, this is all um, alternatives to animal protein. It's all plant-based protein. If you don't want to feed meat, we have that option on there. Um, this is a list of foods that contain the uh, zeoxithin. So that's a nice high levels at the top, and then she's and see the spirulina's on there, um, moderate levels, and then low or trace levels. So that should give you an idea. If you can't get your hands on the actual spirulina powder, um, you can do some of these foods here to get the zeaxanthin into their diet. I don't know why these words have to be so complicated. Um, foods containing carotenoids, so same kind of list. These are moderate to high beta carotene. And then it mentions uh, the tannin being a color booster on this article also. Color enhancing foods. Yeah, I bet she probably does. Yeah. I bought that at the health food store also. They had it in bulk in the um like plastic those plastic jars like the old time almost like the old time candy jars um so she has all different like dried flowers in there and spirulina so i would go in there periodically and stock up and you can buy it by the ounce like you scoop as much as you want into the bag so if you only need like a tablespoon of it you can buy just a tablespoon of it so that's my preferred way of of getting some of this stuff. So this talks about um, foods for color enhancing, like I, and I talked about earlier. There's, yeah, yeah I know you live nowhere, out in the middle of nowhere. Um, spirulina, kelp, oak leaves, and bark, and raisins can also help boost their color. And this talks a little bit more about the astaxanthin, and um, that it's the red orange pigment that you see. Uh, yeah, like the, um, I'm sure like lima beans and um, northern beans and beans are pretty cheap. People food for your hermit crabs. So this is some stuff that um, that you can feed to your crabs. It's not considered pet food, but that's typically considered people food. And um, you would want to feed these in moderation. Uh, popcorn. Plain, no salt, no butter. And then it talks about the same thing I do. Buy small quantities and pop, pop them in the microwave. Um, hot dogs, make sure you get all natural. And just feed them once in a while because there's a lot of nitrates and other stuff in hot dogs. Um, we don't have any known research as to their effects. 
but you should just limit that kind of stuff. Um, my hermit crabs would get really, really piggy over pieces of hot dogs and would drag them off in the corners and bury them, and that can get really gross in your tank. But if you can find, like, an all-natural hot dog, um, I don't know, like, if kosher hot dogs would be better. I don't eat a lot of hot dogs. And this is, like, something that I might give once a year. I, I wouldn't recommend doing it all the time. Hot dogs aren't even good for us. Yeah. Um, baby food. That's another one that's good if you have a crab that's lost its pincher and is have, having trouble eating. Organic baby food. Unsalted pretzels. Oh, that's true. They couldn't drag off the whole hot dog. You might have like a battle to the death over the hot dog, though. Uh, peanut butter that's all natural with no salt added. And honey we talked about. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm shooting down your ideas, aren't you? I just know, like, I used to have this crab named Violet. And when I gave her hot dog, she turned into a little beast. She would go and drag it into the corner and she would sit face first into the corner with that piece of hot dog clutched in her pinchers. And so because her shell was facing out, nobody would get to her. And she might sit like that for days until that hot dog started getting so gross that I'd like have to forcibly take it away from her. She was ridiculous with hot dogs. If you're going to serve honey, put it in a small dish, like a bottle cap. Otherwise, your crabs will climb into it and then get honey all over them, and then the substrate sticks to them. Um, bones, like I said, remove the meat if you use any seasoning, and then take a hammer, smash it, and then they'll eat the, the marrow. Unsalted crackers, uh, plain cereal with no sugar added, plain rice cakes, Eggs. Um, raw is okay, but it's going to be messy. Scrambled is probably a better option. The eggshells you can crush into a fine powder or even serve them whole. Protein, such as unseasoned fish, chicken, turkey, beef, pork, tofu. Beef liver is um, on the list of foods that are beneficial, I think, on the, the chart. Sardines, if you can find, like, natural sardines in oil with, like, no additives and no added salt, I feel like that's really hard to find. But if you do find something that fits that bill, then they would be safe also. And there's lots of different nuts that they can eat. And I have um, from Crab Botanicals, she sells a mix that's called Bugs and Nuts. And it's just, like, ground-up bugs and nuts. And um, I fed that for a long time, and it's a pretty popular kibble. If you want to grow your own food, you can sprout stuff in um, one of these little mini germinators like I have. These are really great. Just a small size. You can also do this directly in the tank. For me, it's working best in my moss. So I have my moss up in the turtle dock. And I've been um, keeping it slightly flooded up there. And the crabs still seem to really like being up there with it, the bottom of the moss being like pretty soppy wet. But with it that wet, I can sprinkle the flax, the chia. And what was the other one? I think there was something else I sprinkled up there. Um, amaranth, maybe. I don't know if it sprouted, though. But the flax and the chia both need to get really wet so that they they form that slimy gel coating. That way they can sprout. So that's an easy way to sprout them right in the tank is just to, to sow them directly into your moss pit and keep that moss pit really kind of soppy wet for a few days. Yeah, they just, like, I wet it down to put the stuff in there. And they just, oh yeah, they just, they're up there all the time, but the extra water is not deterring them at all, so they must like it just a little extra wet. So that's an easy way if you don't want to buy one of these little germinators, but this thing is super easy. Um, you just put a little bit of water in it, and then you put your seeds on the little grid, and then you dip it down in the water to get them wet, and you put the lid on it and put it by a window, and then as soon as they start to sprout, you just um, pop the lid off a little bit to allow for airflow, and they'll just sprout right in there, and then you can pull them out and 
drop them in the tank. This last one is Hermit Crab Food Recipes. And I don't remember who originally created this, but I, I have a feeling it was Carrie Campbell because she did all of our food stuff. <laughs> they throw it around. Yeah, it ends up everywhere, doesn't it? Um, so she's got just a few really easy recipes you can make, and all of her stuff is based on maximum nutrition. So she's got like a fruity fish and flowers. Um, so she says you could air pop the amaranth. That's probably why my amaranth didn't sprout. I need to pop it like popcorn. And then she's got dulse and tuna and oats. Uh, there's quite a few recipes on this page. So if you're just like stumped for making your own food, there's plenty of options on here. And of course you can buy food mixes all over the place. Um, Etsy's a good place. Alaska hermit crab. Um... Hermit Crab Patch, Crab Botanical, she's on Etsy. Uh, I know I'm forgetting some, but there's also links to that on the website. The bottom of this is one of my crabs eating a piece of star fruit up close, which I thought was pretty cool. You get to see how their mouth works. Um, do, oh, that's not on here. Okay. You have to go to the home page and then go down to supplies and um, this is places to get uh, like there's Hermes Kitchen, the Hermit Crab Patch, Hermit Crab Garden to find food and shells and other supplies. We have that kind of divided up into sections there. I think that's everything I have you guys. Do you guys have any questions? Do you guys all know how to get into the files, those of you that are on Facebook, to get into the file section to find the chart or go to uh, CSJ and get the chart from there? You can also find it probably by going to the, the PDF library. Thank you. I'll try to remember to check Google Plus and see if I posted it over there. If I didn't, um, I'll get it posted over there. We or I created, besides the channel, the main Crab Street Journal page, there's um, a community on there called that I created called Hermit Crabs. And so it's a discussion group, just like the group on Facebook. So if you're not a fan of Facebook or you want to just participate in both places... Um, I have this set up and some categories set up. I've been trying to post in there a little bit. Um, there's one other person in there that's kind of actively posting with me, but it would be great if um, you guys came in and joined and, and posted in there also. Pam doesn't do Facebook, and I know she's not the only one, so it'd be great if we had another sort of social place to, to gather and talk about crabs, and it helps build a presence on there too. Oh, it's no problem. I, It helps me kind of refresh myself on some basic stuff so that when people ask me, I don't have to go digging. These little bite-sized research sessions have been good for me, too. And it gave me a chance to update the chart because there were a couple things on there that were kind of confusing. And I wanted to make sure that we stated, you know, like, um, because we mentioned, like, cat and dog food on here. But it needs to be, it needs to be organic cat and dog food, and um, organic crab food, and organic fish flakes. Post a link on Facebook for, oh, to the Google Plus community? Yeah, I should probably do that, huh? That's a good idea, Anne. <laughs> you should be one of our social media moderators. So if you're interested in buying some of the green sand, you can either contact me on Facebook or through the Crab Street Journal, uh, the main page. You can PM me on there. You can email me. I'm crabstreetjournal at gmail.com. And let me know that you want a little Ziploc bag. I think those bags full hold about three tablespoons. Um, and that's packed pretty full. I can hardly get here. <laughs> 
<laughs> you're doing a better job though. You're here almost every time now. But if you want to buy some of that sand from me, I'll, I'd be happy to send some of it off. But I'll put some of it in the prize bin too so that it can be won. Marnell, hopefully your poster shows up soon. Anybody have any other food-related questions or just non-food-related questions before I let you all go? Okay, sounds good, Pam. I also have the chia seeds and flax seeds in those same Ziploc bags in the prize bin, too. Because I know, like, especially with, like, Beth, where she has four crabs, it's kind of ridiculous to go out and buy like a bag that has like four cups <laughs> of seed in it because it would take her forever um about why we shouldn't do false bottoms i don't have a false bottom in my tank but i don't use a fogger either I was completely unaware that people were doing that until just a few months ago. Oh, you have small bags at your Walmart. Okay, well, that's good. I feel like the Ziploc bag I bought was um, several cups, and I divided it down into a lot of shared bags. I don't know if I could do a whole... Yeah, um... Yeah, I know they insist on it, and I, I don't know that I could do a whole periscope on it because I, I don't really, I mean, I guess if you want to do it, do it, but I don't feel that it's necessary to have a false bottom because I've had my crab habitat for over 12 years. It's never flooded. I don't have a false bottom. I mean, I just, and it seems very complicated for a lot of people. And adds another le level of complexity to setting up the crabitat. Um, you know, if you're an advanced hobbyist and you want to do that, then more power to you. But when somebody can't even get a 10-gallon tank set up right, and then you start throwing at them that they got to do a false bottom. Keep trying them, Beth. Mine, um, you gotta you got to soak the chia seeds until they get that big slimy bubble on them and then put them someplace that they'll sprout and then they'll eat the sprouts. Mine didn't eat them the very first time, but yeah, it's gross. It's like, they look like little snot balls, <laughs> but they didn't eat them the very first time. And then they later started eating them. I, uh, I did find let me look here and see. When I was looking at doing um, this new tank, and I didn't want to do a false bottom, but because of the way I want to set it up, it's going to be a whole new setup for me. Yes, they do eat gross things. And um, I wanted to make sure that I had plenty of aeration. I was a little more concerned about, like, the... the because the substrate is going to be deep, that I might have an in, uh, increased risk for um, bacteria, which has never happened to me, knock on wood. Um, I'm not going to get it fixed. It's going to cost, I called a shop and they told me it'd be cheaper just to buy a new tank. So I'm back beating the bushes of Craigslist and let it go and walla pop looking for another tank that's the exact same dimension so that all my stuff will fit. Like I had plexiglass and everything pre-cut for this tank. So the mountain of stuff I have downstairs to go in this tank is ridiculous. I did so much pre-planning for this, which is something I never do, which makes it that much more difficult that it fell through on me. So anyway, I, I stumbled across these Hydro Ball things. So I ordered these. And you can use them to, uh, that's not a good picture. They can be used to, here, add humidity, but they also can be used, like, if you want to make, here they're using them, like, to make a, um, uh, in, 
in tank fountain, which I'm not going to do, but they make a nice drainage layer. So I'm going to take these little hydro balls and in the new tank, I'll have a layer of the hydro balls at the base and then a layer of sphagnum moss and then my substrate. So that the sphagnum moss will prevent the substrate from sifting down and really packing around the hydro balls. And then if I do, for some reason, have a little bit of a water issue, they'll absorb the excess water. So they're like little... Um, see, they're clay. So they would absorb any excess water that would end up down there. So it's like more of a natural false bottom, I guess, maybe. Um because they're just clay, they're safe, and then the moss over the top gives you a dividing layer, and then my substrate, of course, above it. So I'm hoping this will be a good option for me. I'll let you guys know once I find another tank and start setting it up, what I think of those, and I guess then, you know, we can, we'll monitor it together long term once I get it all set up, because we'll be doing more periscopes, and then I'll have two tanks to look at. Hi, Stacy. We're just kind of wrapping up. It's been almost an hour. I didn't realize I had talked that long. I felt like I went through that pretty fast, but I had a lot of material. Something similar in your reef tank. Ah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it looked cool the way they were doing it in the terrarium with the waterfall thing, but I don't want flowing water in there. I just liked the idea that that they are naturally absorbent and being clay, you know, and the little balls, and they look like they have holes in them, so they would, like, naturally aerate, yeah, and naturally um, bump up your humidity. But it should help keep the substrate from getting waterlogged, and it would allow me a layer to quickly see if I had water down that low, you know. I'd be able to tell pretty quickly, and then maybe could get in and siphon it out, you know. But again, I've never had that happen, um, and I've had, I've had, I mean, I use large water dishes, but I've had pools in the past. Um, I get maybe I've been lucky and they just haven't broken. But if you double, if you do the plastic bowls for your water pools and you double them, that should take care of any leaks. Small clay balls in the filter instead of the carbon, huh? That's a good idea, too. So, yeah, if you double up the plastic bowls, then you wouldn't have to... Both of them would have to spring a leak for it to flood your tank. Uh, if you're using, like, um, Edis uses five-gallon glass aquariums in his 500-gallon tank. Um, and I guess it's possible one of those could break a seal... But the way his tank is set up, he has so much vertical space that it would be more of a mess to clean up than harmful for the crabs. The crabs could just climb up up above the, the substrate level and be fine. So, Hydro balls. Going to go into my tank. All right, guys. Well, thanks for joining me tonight. Hope everyone had fun. Hope you learned something new. I'll be looking forward to all the pictures of your hermit crab food that you're going to be whipping up in the coming week. Hopefully you guys find some recipes that you like on the website. Maybe try some of those out. You're welcome. <laughs> Good show. <laughs> it helps when you guys are here to keep me company so I don't feel like I'm talking to myself. All right, well, I'm going to get off of here. Well, I'll get off of here so you can go watch the replay. And since I pretty much covered everything, I'll periscope down and uh, talk to you guys on the website or on Facebook and Google. And I hope all of you, I don't want to talk about that tank, folks. I hope all of you are going to upload a photo for the contest because tomorrow is the last day. Got to be in by midnight tomorrow. And I'm entering a photo this month for crab attack or calendar crab. So you guys better go over there and post your pictures. Bye-bye.